So, thank you. No problem, no problem. You were perfectly right. So, I think it was a good um, way from the last panel discussion to my topic, because the last panel discussion was about um, business models as well. And I would like to share some insights with you um, about IoT business models. Um, why am I standing here? Um, well, I think I'm a digital pioneer. I'm 49 years old and I started my first digital business with 26. So I started an internet agency back in 1995. I think it was one of the first in Munich. And we started with three people in a garage and the company now is uh, 250 people and we develop software solutions um, for digital innovation projects. In the last 20 years, um, I have seen a lot of trends come and go, and I have seen a lot of business models come and go. So my business model in the beginning was very easy. I just sold services to create websites. So that was easy, and during the Web 1.0 period, you normally create websites for company. There were no, no websites at all in 1995. Even Siemens and the large corporations didn't have anything. And then you pro, um, progress step by step. You do the first shops, do first uh, small, uh, small uh, apps and game stuff. And um, we moved on to the Web 2.0, where we tried to set up a first community. So it was a user-generated content. and. We actually tried to set up a first, uh, we call it film network, which was a, a platform comparable to Facebook, but only for the movie industry. And we tried to target it to actors and directors. And it was based on a subscription fee, and the business model really failed. I mean, it didn't work. Uh, actors were just not interested to be presented in a database. So we missed that point. So we went on to the next business model, which was more or less the dot-com phase. So we took all this dot-com hype with us. We had a lot of customers having a lot of money and pushing it all into these new technologies. That was around 2000. And as you know, in 2001, 2002, there was this big dot-com bubble exploded, which uh, was also for me personally, uh, let's say, the down point of my, my career. Um, I remember one uh, month where we had, I think, 5,000 uh, euros revenue and 20 employees. So, digitalization is not always fun, okay? But I think since then, um, a lot of things have changed. Um, the digital models, they, they emerged and they got more mature. And um, what I would like to talk about today is uh, one thing that's going on at the moment um, pretty strongly, and it's a big change. And I think it's a big change on one topic. It is especially um, the... The information that was used in all these systems up to five years ago were mainly created by humans. So they were captured by humans and they were somehow collected by humans. But nowadays, data is generated. Data is generated from machines, from your wearables, from refrigerators, cars, from airplanes, from whatever. And I think this leads to a completely new chance for IoT business models. And if I talk about IoT, Internet of Things, I mean a combination of physical things with a software, whatever it is. And why is it so interesting? Of course, there will be enormous numbers of devices, and they predict 30 billion in the next 10 years, which is quite a bit. Some, some say it could be even 50 billion. But this is not the, the main case. I think um, if you think about if you would be a an owner of a company that is producing machines, let's say well-engineered German machines, and you think about chances, what could IoT really provide for you? I think there are three really important things to keep in mind. First of all, when you put software or let's say a digital service on top of a physical machine, you have the chance to get feedback directly from your customer and to really see is this service accepted? Is he willing to pay? You have these, all these chances that you cannot have when you have a physical product normally. The next thing is, of course, um, you can scale. So once you have a hardware and you have a digital product on top, it doesn't really matter if you have 100 users or 100,000 users. You can scale easily. So the margin costs in IoT business models, they're close to zero, which is uh, remarkable. 
And um, just imagine what uh, it almost cost Elon Musk, his company, when he tried to scale from 300 test model, uh, model 3 a week to 5,000. He almost didn't manage. So scaling is not that easy in a business model um, in a sense of um, way. And the last uh, important point is short management cycles. What does it mean? That means it is interesting for somebody who produces hardware to keep up the speed and the flexibility that you get from software if you add a digital service. Um, I think to, to build and design a car, I think it takes seven years from the design phase until it can be really produced. Uh, software can be written in, in months, even weeks, and I think Amazon deploys software every three seconds. So this is a big, big difference, and that's very interesting for, for companies that are producing machines to really add a digital services. So I would like to give you a few ideas. What should you do or what should you keep in mind if you look at the, if you're interested into uh, IoT business models? And these were some observations and some insights that I collected in the last 20 years. So first of all, I think you need to be brave as a company. Because um, no matter if you're first mover, early adopter, or a late follower, it will be a new area of business that you are facing with your company, and you are not used to this. So more or less, you're stepping into unknown territory. And um, of course, if you step into unknown territory, people are really afraid of risks and afraid of failing. And um, just as a quick um, game how this feels, if I would offer you a bet and say, this is a box, and you have five dark balls and five light balls, and if you pick a dark ball, you get 100 euro, that's an easy bet. What would you be willing to bet? Any ideas? 50. 50 is good. The 50 would be a good bet for this, for this. But if I go a step further and say, I don't tell you anymore how many balls are in this box, what would you bet? Probably not that much anymore. And if I go a step even further and say, hey, we have a box. If there's a black ball in it and you pick it, you get 100 euros, you probably don't pay anything. And this is what we call unknown. I think this is exactly the situation that you're facing when you start into an IoT business model. So you have to learn how to manage the unknown. And um, it's not only about the unknown. It's, there's another challenge, and it's complexity. If you go into IoT business models, you're always faced with complex projects, complex in terms of technology and complex in terms of requirements. And just think about technology. You need hardware. You need software. You need somehow cloud technology. You need uh, analytics. You need maybe some AI component. You need payment. You need all this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of, let's say, uh, components that you have to aggregate. And requirements are not that easy as well. So if you try to describe your digital business model with requirements, you will be, have a hard time in the beginning. And it's not only about the complexity in the project. The problem is that the organizations are normally not desi designed to manage complex projects. So we have normally top-down organization and management in companies. And uh, if I compare this with a simple example, take traffic, for example. So if you're the guy who is in charge of the traffic light control, this is a hierarchical system. So you have to produce some rules and you have a complex scenario of people that are driving in this traffic. So it depends on the time, it depends on the p number of people, maybe there are some accidents, maybe there was a traffic jam in the road next to it, so a lot of things that have to be uh, taken care of when you try to make a rule for this. In the morning, maybe you say 30 seconds green, 30 seconds red, in the evening you have a different one. So how can you solve this complexity? Of course, you could put in some cameras, some sensors, and make it even smarter. But this adds complexity. No, the idea is to reduce complexity by pushing the complexity to the people that are really affected, so giving them responsibility. This is the solution. A roundabout, that's a really, it's just, a, a, uh, let's say, a synonym. But this is a very pragmatic way how you reduce complexity in a company by giving a lot of responsibility to your teams and also the, uh, the capability to take decisions. So if I transfer this to your business, I would give you two recommendations. First of all, form really strong and autonomous teams with a high degree of decision-taking. And the second is 
since we have a lot of different things that you need to have, try to make a, um, a wide variety of skills in the teams. So you need a lot of different knowledge. And um, what else does it help us to, to make things easier? You should think in models. Because the world is so complex, try to reduce complexity and think about easy models. This is a model, a business model uh, designed by the University of St. Gallen, and we, we have a strong partnership with them. Of course, there are other models uh, such as the business model canvas and so on. And, but I really like this one because it's so simple. You only have to ask yourself four major questions when you look, think about a business model. The main question, who is my target group and what problem does he have? The second is, what is my solution? How can I solve this problem? What is my value proposition? The third is, how do I really create this solution? Do I need a software? Do I need a tool? Do I need a hardware? And the fourth, of course, is the most important, the revenue model. How do I earn money or why do I do this? And I have um, run a few workshops with uh, top management of large corporations, and it is incredible to see the flow of creativity, even if top management is working, just by these, answering these four easy questions. And you get tens, twenties, you get up to 100 ideas what kind of business is possible uh, when you answer these questions. Of course, you have to drill down because you cannot work with 100 ideas. And uh, there are technologies such as design thinking, uh, lean startup, or um, Google design sprints, or whatever, to really reduce ideas and really come up with, a, let's say, with, a, with a ca customer-centric ideas. Another recommendation for you is um, if you start a project um, in, uh, in this area, we would recommend to go for a hyperthesis-driven project, which means try to put as little effort in the project to get as much certainty, because in the beginning you are unsure about a lot of things. So first of all, you ask yourself, is there a problem where I have a solution? Then the second question is, is there a market, are there people who are interested in this solution? And then you ask yourself, okay, are they willing to pay for this solution? So if you answer the first three steps with yes, then you start thinking about how do you really build this solution? And then finally you scale and try to come up with all these KPIs and stuff like this. So um, I think it is, um, everything is to minimize efforts and, rec and, 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 and risks in, in this process. And, um, Another question or another uh, uh, definition of uh, done uh, is um, being unique with your product. And I think that is an important um, topic nowadays. My observation is that almost all successful business models are focused very much on the customer need and they're very indiv individual. So your iPhone or your timeline Instagram, it is unique. There is not, no comparable timeline to anybody else. Uh, the, um, if you go for Facebook or whatever, or if you take Uber, Uber business model only works because it's very much centric, centered on your personal need. I have a car, I'm going from A to B, I need somebody who's driving me, and these cars are around. So it's very, um, very much centered on, on the person. And uh, I think that's also one reason why the intranet, the intranet of the Fortune 500 is so damn boring. I mean, you log in as a CEO, you get the same information as a, as a security man. So there is, there's hardly any individualization, and I think that's a big, big problem. And when I talk about being brave, as I did before, it's not only about you, maybe about decision makers, but it's also about um, a company. Because um, we are all driven by KPIs. All these companies are driven by KPIs. We're driven by profit, by, uh, let's say, a revenue share, and, and, and so on. And um, I think we have no KPI for failure. And I think that is an important message, because it's, it's stuck in our head, in our attitude. We are not ready for failing. And you will fail. If you start into a, going into an IoT business model, things will be hard and difficult. And of course, you have an agile team which might go wrong for three weeks and, it, and you just blow 100,000 euros. And your boss will ask you, hey, sorry, you just wasted 100,000 euros. But nobody says, thank you, Michael. You saved me millions because you didn't go in the wrong way anymore. 
So this is an attitude also in your head. And um, this uh, quote here from Max Lefgen is, I think, quite famous. Um, he was one of the co-founders, so you see um, it took him a several retries to really be successful. And I put this up here uh, under the headline, Learn Fast, and I think this is an important quote. Uh, the faster you learn, the better is your product. So always keep these cycles and the, the ability to learn in mind when you enter a new business model. And this brings me also to my, um, my last idea. Um, when I, I look at the world at the moment, how complex things are and how much they're changing, I keep asking myself also, what can I contribute and maybe also pass on to my kids? I have two kids and uh, my wife is a teacher and we sit down and think, what can we do? Is, is it good education? What is it? And of course, it, needs, it should be values, it should be a commitment, passion to things. But I think the most important thing is for the future really to be able to adapt and to be able to learn, keep on learning all the time and to react on new situations. And this is what we're trying to pass and also the, the braveness to be brave also when you fail. And um, so I would like to finish and I uh, wish all of you the best with your business models and your journey into the unknown territory. And I hope you enjoy the rest of 48 Forward. Thank you. <laughs>